This message is one of the Times Square Pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing to World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 214-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to your friends. Father, I pray that your unction, your anointing be upon me tonight to deliver this precious word. I pray that every spirit of the enemy, every lying spirit, every principality and power of darkness be cast out. We take your authority and your dominion so that the word can be ministered in life. We thank you for your power, Jesus. Break loose in the preaching of the word tonight. Lord, there are people need to hear this word. There are people, Lord, who do not pray whatsoever. And they'll never move into the realm of the miraculous until they learn to pray. God, convict us of our prayerlessness. Holy Spirit, touch me tonight. I need your touch. I need your divine strength. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, I can't read the book of Acts without feeling very much ashamed. I'm ashamed that we don't live up to what I read in this book. Even the layman like Stephen and Philip, who waited on tables, were so full of the glory of God. They performed miracles. They stirred entire cities. And how does anybody read the book of Acts without that wonder and amazement at how they were able to get a hold of God and He moved in such miraculous ways in them and among them? You read this book of Acts, it's so thrilling. You hear of angels appearing. The angels come right into the jails knock off their chains, pick them up, and, and, and they say, follow me, and they go walk right through. The, the gates open of their own accord. The angel just walks toward them, and the gates open. We hear of angels walking among them. We hear of mighty visions, clear, detailed visions. Cripples are healed and go leaping through the temple. Peter is so full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible said the sick were brought out in the streets, in their beds, in their couches, just, so the shadow of Peter just touching them, they might be healed. That's found in Acts 5, 15, if you don't believe it. Just that his shadow. There was such faith and expectancy in the city of Jerusalem. The Bible says there were special miracles recorded here. One especially, the scripture says, and, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, I, I've received in the mail from, quote, healing evangelist, little pieces of paper designed like a cloth. I've, I've, had, I've had missionaries send me a pile of dirt. I mean, the evangelist send me a pile of blessed dirt. I've, uh, there's every kind of gimmick, and this is not a gimmick, folks, in this book of Acts. I mean, this man had faith. He prayed over those handkerchiefs and aprons, and they laid them out on some that demon possessed, those demons would flee. There was something here in the book of Acts that we've not discovered. The houses in which they prayed were literally shaken. Now, I wouldn't want God to shake this theater. It's too old. <laughs> literally, I don't know if it could stand it, but I, it, they literally were shaken. I mean, they were so miraculously under the power of God, they survived shipwreck and stoned, stonings. Paul was once stoned and taken out of the city for dead. He gets up and walks away and holds another revival meeting. Now, even when they were stoned, and like Stephen, and were not rescued from it, it was so miraculous, the stoning, that the heavens opened, and Jesus appears standing before them all. He sees an open heaven. Now, why don't we live like that? Why don't we see the book of Acts coming to life? I'm not talking about uh, what we call miracle services today. I, I, I get these brochures and these posters, signs, wonders, and miracles. Come see the great man of God. I'm talking about a miraculous way of living. Not just preaching, but a miraculous way of living. Friends, God hasn't changed. We have. God is more concerned. He's more willing to give us today than he was then. But there's an idea in the land today that goes something like this. We don't need this kind of thing today because we're more educated today. We're a little more intelligent. We have more revelation knowledge. And... They needed those miracles because God was establishing the church. And he had to have them to establish the church. Well, I want you to know, friends, if they needed it then, we need it now all the more. 
we need it all the more. If the establishment of the church needed the power of the Holy Spirit and miracles, the closing day of the church needs it even more. Do I have to remind you what we're facing today? Do we have to talk about the evil men waxing worse and worse according to the Scripture? Sin abounding many times over? Seducers being increased? Violence breaking out on all sides? Hell has enlarged its borders? Demons have come forth like a flood? There's apostasy? We're living in what the Bible calls the great falling away. We're in the middle of that right now, the great falling away. Satan and his angels are coming, pretending to be ministers of the gospel. And folks, on the judgment day, it's going to be interesting to find out how many undiscerning Christians have been sending money and following evangelists to have come as angels of light to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect, the chosen of God. The Bible said that the devil will bring forth preachers of the gospel who will be appearing as angels of light. But they're angels of darkness. They're under demon powers. Abortion has filled the land with blood guiltness. Parents are molesting their own little children. The newspaper today said one child a day is now being murdered through molestation. Even the babies are being molested now. Right out of the crib. Our young people are spinning out of control. Cocaine and crack. Heroin. Into our schools with devastation. Turning 15-year-old kids into killers and thieves. There's all kinds of new diseases like herpes and AIDS that uh, my generation knew nothing about. And folks, we need more of Jesus. We need more of His power. We need more of His miracles manifested among us today than any time in history. But we've not been willing to pay the price. The apostles knew the price and they gladly paid it. First of all, God moved miraculously in the first church because they were given to prayer. They had given themselves to prayer. Now the book of Acts is actually about holy men who knew how to move God through prayer. My message tonight is about prayer. About prayer. I'm going to tell you right up front. Now whether it was in the upper room, whether it was in prison, they prayed. If they were in some secret hiding place away from the authorities, they prayed. If it was Simon's house in a street called Straight, they prayed. They prayed in the morning. They prayed at the noon. They prayed all night. They prayed without ceasing. Cornelius, the Bible said, prayed always. They prayed on rooftops. They prayed on seashores and temples and deserts. They prayed everywhere. Unceasingly, the early church was a church of prayer. They spent hours and days shut in with God until they received very, very clear direction from God. I'm amazed at the detailed guidance that the children of God had in this first church. What incredible specifics they got from God. I want you to go to the ninth chapter of Acts. You have the book of Acts open, go to the ninth chapter, and I want to show you something thrilling, how detailed, specific God got with His people when they prayed. Ninth chapter. Let's begin reading at the tenth verse. Acts 9, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire of the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, and behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias, coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. I want to stop there for just a minute, but I want you to listen to the details. Look what it says. God says, first of all, go. And then he names the very street. It's called straight. Do you see that? The street's called straight. He's directed to the very house. He's told the name of the householder, Simon's house. Street called straight. And he's even told uh, that, there's a, that there, there's someone there by the name of Saul of Tarsus. He's even given the name. And also... God says, I've talked to him and he's seeing you coming in, laying hands on him. Now, how would you like to get directions like that? And you know why? And, and here's, here's a newborn baby, Saul. And God is saying to this young man, uh, to, the, to this young convert, he's just been saved a few days. In the Bible, why would God speak so clearly to Saul, only three days old in the Lord? 
And he's saying, you go into Damascus and he'll be told you what to do. And he goes and he's on his face. And he's seeking God. And God says to this baby convert, Saul, I'm going to send a man to you and his name is Ananias. Now how would Saul know there's an Ananias in the city? This is in Damascus. And you're going to see him coming. And he's going to lay hands on you because Saul was blind at this time. He said, he will lay hands on you and you will be healed and he'll tell you what to do. He'll tell you. He's going to give you directions. So Saul goes into this room. Now why would God speak like that? Well, look, look at verse 11. The last four, three words, or four words. Behold, he prayeth. What was Saul doing those three days and three nights? He was not eating, he was not drinking, he was fasting and he was praying. And here's how he got this detailed direction from the Lord. <laughs> you know, this is so very important. Look at verse 6. Uh, well, let's start at verse, five, verse 4, 9. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Who art thou, Lord? He even names him. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Because Jesus said, if you persecute the church, you're persecuting me. Now I'll tell you something, anytime the devil persecutes any one of you, he's persecuting Jesus. Because we're his body. And he trembling, or, 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 who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? The Lord said to him, arise, go to the city, it shall be told thee what thou must do. Arise and go. Now look at me, please. The Holy Spirit, as soon as he was saved, said, Go pray. That's the message. Go pray. Go seek my face. Learn to wait on me. Show me that you want more of me. And I want you to know directions came, no vision came until after he prayed. And then the powerful vision of what he was to do. He learned in this time to lean on the Lord, to get the leading of God. Saul didn't need a counselor. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to somebody for counseling. He needed no prophet to show him what to do. He needed no word, a special word. I can't tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of people have come to me saying, I have a word for you. Now, if it's from God, I thank Him for it. Nine out of ten times, it's somebody who's just very overzealous and, and wants God to bless me or something, and they give me word because if I, in one day, I can get ten different words conflicting one with another. So either they made a mistake or God didn't. God doesn't make mistakes. And I'm not putting that down. But the Lord said, I will show him. I'll show him. And I can picture a fundamentalist preacher coming in. And Saul is on his face before God, and he's weeping, and he's moaning, and he's crying, Oh, God, Jesus, reveal yourself in me, not just to me. Because later, Paul was to say, The Lord revealed himself in me. Not to me, but in me. And there's a difference of having Jesus revealed to you and in you. And he's praying, Lord Jesus, reveal yourself in me. And here comes this fundamentalist preacher. And he walks in there, and he sees Saul weeping, and, and he takes him by the shoulder and he said, young man, don't you know that since you've been saved, there's a dying world out there. They're going to hell. And you need to get out there because God's plan for you after salvation is witnessing evangelism. Now, you know we believe in that. But I know what Saul would have answered. This preacher comes in. Because you see, there's some people believe that the only purpose of God in saving Christians is to make witnesses out of them. Well, that is true. We're all witnesses, but there's something comes before that. You better not go out and be a witness till you do what Saul did. You shut yourself in with God and learn to hear his voice. You learn to hear his guidance so that you don't need a counselor, you don't need a prophet, you don't need anything but this book and your bare knees. Now, God does use people. We're not putting that down. Not at all. But this fundamentalist, Paul, I'm sure Saul would say, Is your name Ananias? No, sir. Well, then I'm waiting, sir, for a man named Ananias because I had a vision. He said, You had a what? I had a vision. He said, Well, while you're here having visions and waiting on the Lord, souls are dying out there. 
And I'm glad Saul wasn't saved in 1988 because we would have gotten a hold of him and we'd have turned him into a media hype. I mean, we'd have had him writing a book, we'd have had posters, and we'd have preachers all over America inviting him to their church to tell this fantastic testimony. I'm glad the Lord said, go to Damascus and hide. Go and pray. And I can just hear Saul say, well, brother, I, I can't help it. I heard God. I saw Jesus. He appeared to me. Can you, can you imagine telling that to some people today who believe the miracles are over? I've seen Jesus. Now, folks, this is all in the day of grace. This is all since the cross, the very day in which you and I live. And, and, and Saul just says, Brother, I can't help it. The Lord told me I had a vision. I know the man's name. I know what he's going to do when he walks in here. And I know he's going to lay hands on me. And my eyes are going to be open. Say what you will. I'm waiting. Oh, thank God for that kind of a convert. Thank God for that kind of a backbone. Can walk down to this altar. Get saved. And God says, go home and pray. Go home and get a hold of Jesus. Until you know his voice. Until nothing can shake you. So that any preacher, any prophet, anybody can come and say, well, that's not the way I see it. You say, well, I heard from Jesus. He talks to me. He talks to me. Does Jesus talk to you? He talks to me. Here, here comes, uh, he leaves and before Adonis gets there, here comes the charismatic prosperity success teacher. And he says, Brother Saul, I want to give you an autographed copy of my latest book, Covenant Rights. And I'm not being facetious. This is the way American people think. It's stupid. Saul, what are you weeping? I heard about how God touched you. You've been saved. Thank God. You don't have to cry anymore. I would that you saw prosper be in health. Saul says, well, dear brother, I don't know what you're talking about. Is your name Ananias? <laughs> no, it's not Ananias. I said, well, I'm waiting for Ananias. Okay, God told me he's going to come in here. And, and this brother says, hey, wait a minute. You're just a baby Christian. I've been walking with God for years. And I've got revelation knowledge. You need to sit down and listen. Saul says, I don't know what you're talking about, brother. And I, I love you, but I'm telling you, God came to me. The Lord spoke to me. I'm waiting for a man named Ananias. He's going to walk in here. They had me. I'm going to see. He's going to tell me what to do. All I know, Saul can say, is that Jesus talked to me. He told me to wait. Hallelujah. And one moment later, here comes Ananias. And he, he uh, can you imagine that moment? Paul, uh, Saul can't see, but as soon as he walks in the door, I know the Holy Spirit spoke to Saul. Here's your man. And I can hear Saul say, Ananias. And this brother says, Brother Saul. The Lord had already given them the names. And I can see... Saul just raised, he's kneeling, raising his hands, nodding, sticking his head out because he knows what's coming. And so Ananias walks right over. And, and you know what Ananias says? Because in a vision, Ananias had heard, Go thy way, he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. How unlike what's being preached today. I'm going to show him that he's going to suffer for my glory. And then I laid his hand on him and says, Brother Saul. The Lord has shown me you're going to suffer many things. And I believe Ananias began to enumerate. You're going to be shipwrecked. You're going to be cast in prison. You're going to have converts turn against you. The whole world's going to turn against you. You're going to be a testimony of the church through all ages. You're going to be a testimony of the suffering power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to fill up the sufferings of Jesus. And then he said, Brother Saul, be healed. And suddenly his eyes... Well, look what the scripture says. And I, Ananias, verse 17, went into in his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, he sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it were scales and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Hallelujah. Well, you know what happened to him from then on, don't you? He suffered. And he set an example for all of us to follow the glory of Jesus. Then there's a man called Peter. Remember him? 
Hallelujah. He's praying on the rooftop one afternoon. In fact, it was noon. 30 miles away at Caesarea, there's a man by the name of Cornelius. You find this in the next chapter, it's chapter 10. Just flip over to chapter 10. All right, they're 30 miles apart. Caesarea is over here. And here's a man by the name of Cornelius. The Bible says, uh, look at verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave uh, great alms to the people and prayed to God. How much? Continually, always, he prayed to God. He saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up from memorial before you. Now look at the details. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He even gave him his surname. He gave him his, his first name and he gave him his surname because there were two Simons there. God said, I want you to get the right one. He was living, he was staying with Simon. He said, his name is Simon. Oh, by the way, his surname is Peter. Look at the details. He lodges with one Simon, and he goes on to tell him he's a tanner. You go down to this man, he's a tanner, whose house is by the sea side, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And by the way, at the same time, these men are on the way. God leads Peter up on the rooftop. In verse 9, you see it. And on the morrow as they were on their journey, drew nigh unto the city. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now, it was only 30 miles away, and so they're getting close to Joppa. And while these men are approaching the city, the Holy Spirit just promised Peter, go up on the rooftop and pray. And while they're approaching the city, he goes up on the rooftop to pray about the sixth hour. It's noontime. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they were made ready, he fell into a trance. And by the way, uh, you look down to verse 18, uh, or 19, Then Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Three men. Look at the details again. Isn't that wonderful? He, he fell, he'd fallen into a trance, means he had a vision. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Go with them. I've sent them. Now, Peter, look this way, please. Peter, you'll find out, goes down to the house of Cornelius. This man who prayed always, continually. Now, think about this. This man is a Gentile. He, he doesn't have uh, all of the background of the apostles in Jerusalem. But this man is seeing angels. This man is getting such clear direction. Send three men. Send them up to Joppa. Go to a, a man's house by the name of Simon, and you'll know him because he's a tanner. He probably had a sign out there. And he's by the seashore, by the way. And he will tell you what to do. It's incredible the direction that this man got. And Peter, in the meantime, he's praying. And the Lord says, there's three men going to knock on the door. And just about that time, there's a knock on the door. And I'm sure Peter could have called down to his host and said, let those three men in. And they look around and he's up there. No way he can see. Let those three men in. How does he know? He's a praying man. The Lord Jesus talks to Peter. The Lord Jesus talks to Cornelius. Hallelujah. You, you see him going down. and you, you know the great story of the revival broke out. Peter comes on the scene and he hears the whole story over again. Here comes Cornelius saying, I was praying and, and I saw an angel. This angel appeared to me and he told me where you were to your house number. Ten, send three men and you'd come and you're here. And the glory of God came down, filled him with the Holy Ghost and the Gentiles received the gospel. Hallelujah. Look at, uh, by the way, do you, do you understand that all through the book of Acts, if, you, if you'll take time this next week and just go through the book of Acts, stop and look and, and be reminded how many times it says, God said to them. Uh, the Lord said to them, the Holy Ghost said to them, or the angel said to them. All through the book, God speaking. Heaven is speaking to His people. Heaven was not closed. They got, clear mind, they got the clear mind of God. There was nothing flaky about it, nothing fuzzy about it. It was very practical, very detailed, very clear. 
but it only came after much prayer. Go to uh, thir Acts 13, and I'll, I'll show you we're talking about much prayer after much prayer. Acts 13. Verse 1, Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Serene, and men which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, there it is again, the Holy Ghost said, folks, could you put your finger on that a minute and then look to me? Look up here. Does the Holy Ghost ever talk to you? I ask you again, has the Holy Ghost ever talked to you? Does He talk to you every day? As they ministered to the Lord. I don't think you're going to hear it parked in front of your TV set. I don't think you, I don't think you want your unsaved loved ones to be saved if you come to the pastors and say, pray for my unsaved husband or my unsaved children, and you sit there laughing with Cosby, and you're going through Dinus and Dallas and sitting in that flood of filth. You're not wanting God to save them. You're not wanting God to save them. As they ministered to the Lord and as they fasted, the Holy Ghost spake and said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when, see, first of all, God speaks to them, and then after God tells them what to do, they pray again. And when they'd fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Sent forth by the Holy Ghost. They fasted and prayed. Do you know, there's another picture of Paul. He's... he's been captured by uh, the Jews. He's been in the temple and they capture him and they're about to take him away to the castle. And if you go to Acts 22, Acts 22, I'll show you just one more vignette, one more picture of this before we move on. Acts 22, verse 11. Paul is rehearsing to the Jews what happened to him. Verse 11. Acts 22, verse 11. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, He's talking about his conversion. And being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having good, good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said be unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, the God of our fathers, I want to show you three things that God spoke to him. God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his what? That thou shouldest know his will. Secondly, and thou shalt see, and, and see that just one. That's a vision of Jesus. And number three, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witnesses unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now I want you to look at verse 14. And here's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Here is God's plan for every convert, everyone who comes to these altars, everyone who calls yourself by the name of Jesus. You've been chosen that you should know His will. Do you understand it's not God's best, it's not in His plan at all that you go about not knowing His will. That you should know His will for your life. That you should see that just one. You should see a vision of Jesus. Jesus should become ever dearer to you. He's not first, he's everything. I say it over and over again. And thou shouldest hear the voice, and it says of his mouth, from his mouth. Not second hand, that you hear his voice directly. He speaks directly from his mouth. Brother, sister, if we don't have a church that learns to hear from his mouth, if we don't have a church that's able to shut themselves in and hear and discern the voice of the Lord, you're going to be torn by every wind and wave of doctrine. You're going to be cast around, used and misused the rest of your Christian experience. Hallelujah. God's people today could receive the very same clear word from God if there was the same intensity to seek His face in prayer. I'm going to say it again. We could have the same thing today if we would pray like they did, with the same intensity. Do you know that Christians seldom pray today? Do you know that preachers seldom pray today? Because we have been taught to take everything by faith. Now listen, we preach faith here. 
Brother Victor is just about to conclude a marvelous six weeks on the true meaning of faith, the meaning of true faith. We believe in repentance, we believe in study of the Word of God, <clears throat> we believe in walking by faith, but not to the exclusion of prayer. Not to the exclusion of prayer. Obedience, repentance, the Word of God, faith, and prayer are all a part of the same thing. Same cloth. But it's, it goes like this. Why should we pray? Why plead with God when He's already promised it? If He knows what we need, the Scripture says, before we even ask, why should we ask? And there are some people that teach today, and I know it, I've heard it, for us to ask God for something He's already promised is unbelief, they say. If you go and ask God more than one time, they say it's unbelief. The second time it's unbelief because if you believed Him the first time, you wouldn't have asked the second time. And that's wrong. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you conclusively from the Word of God that that's not true. Not true at all. Do you remember Abraham? Abraham had the promise of becoming a mighty nation. He had that promise locked up securely in his bosom. God had already made him this promise. Listen to it. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. God had promised to bless everyone who blessed him and curse everybody who cursed him. Abraham also had great faith, so much so that God counted it to him for righteousness. The scripture says, And Abraham, Abram believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now look, he's a man of God. He's secure in the promises, full of faith, yet he runs time and time again to the altar to pray. I'm going to read it to you. Genesis 12, 8, don't turn there. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Why is he calling on the name of the Lord when the promise is already secured? Why, when God has already said, I count his faith as righteousness, why is he still weeping at the altar? Again, it says in chapter 13, verse 1 and 4, and this is after he came out of Egypt, after the great famine, and Abram went up out of Egypt, and he was very rich, very rich in cattle, and silver, and gold, and he journeyed even to Bethel, unto the place of the altar, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. This man has the promises, he has the faith, yet he's clinging to the promises. Because Abraham, Abram, and Abraham, as God changed his name to, he valued his communion with God more than all the blessings of God. And friends, this is, this is the true meaning of prayer. And that's why God wants us to keep asking for what he's already promised. It's not that he needs that, but we need that. We need that Holy Ghost discipline. Because when you get alone with God, you're changing. You keep changing. Every time you shut the door and pray in secret, you are changing. It's impossible for any Christian to be shut in with God and not be changed by it. And the longer you're shut in with Him, the more important He becomes and the less important the answer becomes. Until finally, you're so enraptured with Him, you say, oh yes, I forgot what I came for. Oh, that's the way it's been coming. That's how it's been coming in my life. Oh, I thank God for it. There was a time when I was a child in prayer and I would go and say, Lord, Lord, you must. You have to do it. Now I say, I must have you, Lord. I must see you. Hallelujah. And by the way, by the time, probably 50% of those things you prayed for dissolve because when you get close to Jesus, He so purifies your desires, you look at it and say, that was flesh. You didn't know it till you got in His holy presence and God was remaking you by prayer. Either way, when you pray, you win. You either don't want it or you get it. But you know, we are atheists in this matter of prayer com compared to the early church. We're atheists. Many today... Look upon secret prayer as hard work, that it's boring, and they do it only occasionally and mostly when they're shamed into it. I'm tired of shaming people into prayer. I don't believe that's going to work. 
If it doesn't work by love, it's not going to work by shame. Can you imagine a husband and a wife living in the same house and they don't talk to each other except when they're in public, she starts talking to him? That's public prayer coming to the house of God. You're going to talk to him now that you're in the house of God and you're going to ne neglect him days on end when you're at home with him? Prayer, hidden secret prayer is the mightiest weapon God's given his church, but it's neglected, it's disdained, it's seldom used. By the way, do you remember uh, the prophet Elijah up on the mountain? And, and the Bible says that, in fact, I'm going to show you just a minute how he's, he was a man of like passion and he went up the mountain and he prayed that the heavens be open. He'd already prayed it shut for three years and now he's praying it open. And he already had the promise that the rain was coming and he goes up on the hilltop with his servant and God has already given the promise the heavens are going to be open. And he prays and nothing happens. Nothing happens at all. So he sends his servant the second time. And he says, see if you see anything on the horizon. Even a cloud, just the size of man's hand. That's all I'm looking for. Just, I know it's coming, but I just need that one little cloud. He comes back and he says, Elijah, there's nothing there. Nothing there. I mean, there's not a cloud in the sky. Are you sure it's going to rain? Yes, it's going to rain. And he bows his head between his knees again and he says, oh God, you promised rain. About this third time, we'd have quit. We'd have said, prayer doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me. Or we'd get angry at God and say, I prayed once, I prayed twice, I even prayed three times. And God didn't hear me. God didn't hear me. You know, he went back the fifth time, he went back the sixth time, and finally the seventh time he goes back, and his servant comes back rather excited. All it is is a little tiny cloud the size of man's hand. And I said, no, that's a storm. That's a storm coming. God told me. And I tell you, he got so excited, he ran down and told Ahab, who was sitting there making fun of him. He said, you'd better get going. You're going to get wet. There's a storm coming. And that old man ran 17 miles ahead of the chariot. You talk about a Holy Ghost jogger. He jogged ahead of that, that chariot. He outran the chariot. Hallelujah. Remember uh, Moses up in the mountain? Uh, God had already told him, you're going to kill all the Amalekites. You're going to have a battle against them. and You're not even going to have to struggle. I'm going to defeat them for you. He sends Joshua down the valley to fight the Amalekites. He goes up on the hill. He already has the promise. He's got the faith. You know Abraham, this meek man, had the faith. If God said you're going to have victory, why is he up on the hill with both hands raised, crying out to God, and his hands get tied so Aaron on one side, her on the other, holding up his hands, seeking God and intercede, even though he had the promise, even though he had the faith. Why? Because God's making something out of us. Hallelujah. He's making prayer warriors out of us. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, let's go on. I, I've got some, so much I want to talk. I want you to go to James, the fifth chapter. James, the fifth chapter. Still with me? Chapter 5, James chapter 5, verse 6, well, let, let's, let's start uh, verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him what? Pray. Let him pray. We don't do that. We go to get somebody to lay hands on us and do the job for us. And there's a place where you go and see it in just a minute. But you're not going to go to the elders until first you pray. You're going to call for the elders and you'll see that and they'll anoint you with oil. But first, any money affect you, afflicted? It doesn't say get on the telephone right away and call the elders, does it? It doesn't say go to church and go to the altar and have them pray for you first. It says, let him pray. Is that in your Bible? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one to another, pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, 
fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know what that means? That unceasing, non-ending prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And Elias, which is Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. You know what that means, subject to like passions? I'm reading from the King James. That means he's a human being who's subjected to the same fears, the same anxieties, the same pressures of life as you and I are. He's ordinary man just like you and I, the scripture says. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now look at me, please, if you will. Here's a man of like passion. He prays earnestly, and he keeps praying seven times, and he says, I will not give up. I will not give up. And I don't want to tell you something, friends. Right here now, God's going to test you in the days ahead. You, you'll say, well, Brother Wilkson, I've learned to pray. But have you learned to persevere in prayer? Have you learned to stay with it? Not even looking for, expecting the answer, yes, but the answer is not the thing, but prefer, prefer, persevering. It's called laying hold of God. Laying hold of God. Bob was preaching along that line this morning. It's the same thing that Jacob said when he wrestled. It's called wrestling with the Lord. Jacob wrestled all night and he said, I'll not let you go until you bless me. Until you ask me, I'll not let you go. Friday night in prayer meeting, there was a young man up here, young convert, and he was praying. He said, oh Jesus, I just wish you were alive today so I could reach out and get a hold of you. And if I got a hold of you, I'd never let you go. I'd call that persevering, wouldn't you? But you see, there's a waiting. Sometimes our prayers are so delayed that that's only to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, the prophets have foretold that in the last days, the calamities are going to fall. In fact, the Bible calls it a day of indignation. We're going to talk about that word in just a moment. And God's going to call forth the holy remnant to be shut up in prayer with him. Now, this holy remnant revival that God has already started in the land is going to have to understand it and, and pick it up very quickly in the Spirit. That God has called us not only repentance and obedience and faith, He's called us to prayer. He's called us to prayer. Do you know Daniel was a man of the Word, and he began to study the Word of God as he was studying the book of Jeremiah. In fact, he was in the 29th chapter. I want you to go to Jeremiah, and I'm going to show you what Daniel saw. Jeremiah the 29th chapter. Jeremiah 29. While you're turning there, the 29th chapter, I want to read to you what Daniel, what Daniel saw, what he went through. I'm reading, you don't have to go to that, but Daniel 9th chapter, beginning of the second verse, it says, I, Daniel understood by books. Now, when he's talking about books, he's talking about the book of Jeremiah and also the book of Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy and the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. You see, Daniel had the same prophets we have. He had these books. The number, he said, I, I was, what are you saying? I was reading Jeremiah and Deuteronomy and the number of the years were of the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would encompass 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now what, what did Jeremiah see? Look at verse 10. Jeremiah 29, 10. And one day, Daniel the prophet was reading from Jeremiah. And here's what he read. For thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think to you, toward you, saith the Lord, are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. That means hope for you at your latter time, at the latter end. Now, folks, look this way for just a minute. Let me, you must catch this in your mind. Listen to it very closely. Jeremiah looked at the calendar. And suddenly it hit him. We have been in captivity 70 years. It's accomplished. God says at the end of 70 years, according to Jeremiah, 
the desolation is going to end. And hope begins to flood his heart. But instead of rejoicing over this grand promise, Daniel falls on his face and he begins to weep because he sees the next verse. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations. And suddenly he says, wait a minute, even though God promises, it's not going to happen unless we fulfill these verses. And he goes to Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just, I'll just read it for, to, to you. But this is Jeremiah, Deuteronomy 4.29. In fact, this is where Jeremiah got it. But if thou from thence, from your captivity, thou shalt seek the Lord thy God. Thou this is the end of side one. You may now turn the table. Him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Now, folks, look this way, please. What God is saying to us is awesome. Not because I'm preaching, because God's trying to say something to us right now. Listen to it prophetically. Jeremiah's on his face. He's fasting. He has sackcloth on his back. He's torn his clothes. You know, we would have, we would have grabbed that promise and run. We'd say, bless God by faith. It's all over. It's ours. And we'd have gone shouting down the street. But Daniel says, no. God says... And if in that day, and if in that day and you see it, you shall call upon me, you shall go and pray to me, I'll hearken. You'll seek me and you'll find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn you away from your captivity. I'll make this promise come to pass. If you'll seek me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Hallelujah. And this is the condition. You'll seek me. You'll call upon me. You'll go and pray unto me. Then I will hearken unto you. Now, in prayer about this message, the Holy Spirit came upon me. And just as sure as Daniel can go into Jeremiah and find out where his day is, where his generation is in history, in God's time clock, do you know that you and I don't need someone coming up on stage calling himself a prophet to tell us what's going to happen? You go to the book, just like Daniel did, you find your place in history. And I found it. And I want you to go to it. I want you to go to Isaiah 26. The Holy Spirit showed me where the church is today. Right now, and I'm doing just like Daniel did. Say, I was in prayer, and I was reading the book. And I found what God is saying to His church in these last days. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. All right. Do you have it open on your lap? I've never believed I was a prophet, but I know God told me to prophesy. And I want you to listen very closely now. I want God, by His Spirit, to make this very, very real to our hearts. Even... Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse 29, the one that I quoted was for Daniel's time. But verse 30 and 31 was not for Daniel's time because it said it's for the latter end. And that latter end message was that we're to seek God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. The same thing would happen even in the latter days. But now I want you to look, verse chapter 26. First of all, God tells us, listen now, God tells us that His goodness being shown to our nation has not brought about repentance. Verse 10. Isaiah 26, verse 10. Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Now look at me, please. Here's what God is saying. I blessed America. I blessed this nation. I made it an upright people to start with. They were Puritans that came to start this whole thing. 
And God said, I've blessed you. And the Bible said the goodness of the Lord is meant to bring about repentance. The goodness of the Lord is poured out on the people that they may be led to repentance. God doesn't want to send judgment. He prefers that people repent under His hand of goodness. But America's turned against it. The Scripture said this favor was shown. They've not learned righteousness. And in the land of uprightness, they deal unjustly. They will not behold the majesty of the Lord. They will not give credit to God for anything. All right? So God is going to send swift judgments. Verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. In other words, there are going to be a praying people that recognize that the night of indignation has come. And in this night of indignation, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Do you see that? All right. God is going to have a people that are aware that judgment is at the door. Verse 9 makes it very clear. This is a, a night of judgment. And God's people are going to have this urgency. The Spirit within them says, Seek the Lord, because the judgments are coming on the land. It doesn't say that they will accept the lessons, but God says, I'm going to teach them. They're going to learn that I am majestic, that I'm a holy God. They're going to learn it. All right? In the midst of all of this judgment that's coming, God's going to raise up a travailing remnant. Go to verse 17. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not brought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. The dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Now, listen. You may not know it. You may not understand it fully yet, but I hope God will open it to you. You know he's talking about you and me right now. These three verses I read to you apply to 1918. 88, right now, here in Times Square Church, it has to do with America, it has to do with our nation, it has to do with the Holy Remnant. Do you know that there are hundreds of you here tonight represent this woman with child? And you, were doing, you, you had something inside of you. I don't know when it happened. Did it happen a year ago, two years ago? When did God start stirring you? When did something happen to you where you, where you said, look, there's got to be more? Jesus is coming, judgment is coming. What am I doing playing games? What am I doing with toys? I'm talking about adult, adult toys. Why am I fooling around with materialism? And God began to stir your heart. I don't know whether it was a year ago, two years ago, but there was something like coming up inside a pregnancy, so to speak. There was something rising in you. There was a hunger. There was a thirst. There were birth pangs. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You got hungry. You weren't getting it. All you got, there were birth pangs, and you were travailing. You said, I want more, I want God. There's got to be, and you start hearing a message of holiness and separation. Walking with God. You heard the demands of His love. And you begin to respond. Because you say, up to this time, I came to the birth, but all I gave birth to was wind. All I heard were winds and ways of doctrine. I didn't bring anything forth. There was nothing there. I tried. I wept. I sought. I went from church to church. I went everywhere looking for something. There was something coming alive. I wanted. I had to have a release. And folks, God has that kind of people all over this country. He has them in China. He has them in Africa. He's bringing them into travail. There's a travailing inside. It has nothing to do with this church having the only gospel. I'm not for one moment believe this is the only church in New York preaching the gospel. Not at all. Never have and never will. But I believe all over this city God is sending the Holy Ghost with a candle and He's going up and down the streets to find everybody that's in soul travail. Everybody said, I've had enough. I don't want to sit and be tickled in my ears anymore. I don't want to play games. I want to get serious with God. the time of her delivery. She's in pain and she cries out of her pangs. The 
That's what we've been, oh Lord, it says. You're in pain. But something happened. Hallelujah. You were near dead, weren't you? But the dead, verse 19, the dead men shall live. Glory to God. Aren't you glad for the day the Holy Ghost got a hold of you and He led you, whether it's here or wherever you had your eyes open, the Lord led you and you walked in and suddenly, suddenly it wasn't the wind anymore. Of wild doctrine, there was resurrection life. Resurrection life. You got convicted of your sins. And you were told you can't go to heaven like that. And you were told you go to hell even talking in tongues if you don't get straight. <laughs> the dead man shall live. And the dew is as the dew of herbs. And I looked at it. Oh, that's a wonderful... You, you ought to see what it says in the original Hebrew. It says... Translated, it says, there's going to fall on me a glory, a glory born out of supernatural light. You came and you saw the light. God started turning on the lights of truth and holiness and righteousness. And suddenly, every day there was fresh dew. The glory of the Lord Jesus began to fall like the dew of the herb, the scripture says. Have you got that dew falling on you right now? Oh, that dew comes every morning, then every day it's fresh and it's alive. When you're walking in the Spirit, every day is a new day. There, there's some new revelation, some new truth comes from the hand of God. Hallelujah. Like dew from heaven. Glory to God. All right, these who are resurrected from spiritual death are called to be called to the prayer chamber. Look at the next verse, verse 20. You're called to the prayer chamber when the dew hits you. Come, my people. Come, my people. Where? Enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors behind thee. That sounds like something Jesus said, doesn't it? When you pray, enter into the closet and shut the door. And the Father sees in secret, so we reward thee openly. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Now look this way, beloved. God is forewarning us here. He said, there's going to be a day of indignation. Come quickly. And that indignation in Hebrew means enraged fury. White hot anger against sin. White hot anger against sin. And I believe that the Lord is already stirring himself right now. And I believe he's mounted his white horse. And I believe he's coming against this generation with quick judgment. The Bible said the earth will disclose her blood and so no more cover her slain. You know what God's going to do? He's going to, go, he's going to open up the bowels of the earth. He's going to pour out a stream of blood. The blood of innocent children. A hundred million slain babies. Do you know that every drop of their blood has been siphoned into a huge dam, a reservoir that God has been saving. And in this last day of indignation, He's going to open up the floodgates. He's going to resurrect it every little tiny bone. And I want you to know that when the indignation of God starts on America, and when there's an economic breakdown and a total collapse, those who have discerning ears are going to hear the rattle of a million, million little bones. God's going to shake and rattle every bone to America. Every little blood corpuscle that's been shed of those little babies that are shed. They're going to see the moon turn to blood and it's going to be a reflection of that sea of blood that the Lord has saved. And every drop of blood will come as judgment on America. He's going to open up the bowels of the earth. Not one of... I tell you folks, if the blood of King fall, cries out from the earth for vengeance... Can you imagine what this sea, this ocean of baby blood is going to cry out judgment against America? And where are we going to be when this happens? Shut in with God, the scripture says, in a secret chamber of prayer. Do you know there's a flood coming? I'm going to, don't go there, it's Revelation 12, 15 to 17. 
and the serpent cast out of his out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. You just heard of the woman right here in verse 17. The overcomers. He's going to send a flood against the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimonies of Jesus Christ. You know what that is? That's a flood of filth coming against the house of God, coming against God's people. And do you know what, you know what that television set is in your house? It's a floodgate. It's a floodgate. And when you turn it on, you open the floodgate, and your mind is being flooded with all the filth out of the pits of hell. And the Bible says you're going to be carried away with the flood. You're going to be carried away because the Scripture says the devil knows his time is short, and he's been cast down on the earth having great wrath. And he's angry. He knows more than some sleeping Christians know. He knows that the coming of the Lord is near. He knows something has happened. He doesn't know the time, but he knows something's happened because he sees all heaven going in motion. And you turn that on and you open the floodgate. Isn't it amazing? God's people don't have time to pray. And they have time to sit for hours and watch something that God has cursed. How do you come, and, how do you come to God's house? I, I wish this could be the last time I say anything about it. And I'm not hung up on television. This idea of everybody have to get it out of their house. Now, I, I, I tell you this, I'm going to tell you honestly. I, I'm going to say it at the risk of 50% of you never coming back. And I say it in love. Not in anger, but I say it in love. The time has come. We're so close to coming to the Lord, so close to that indignation, that wrath of God against sin. You think he's going to judge these porno shops down here and not judge you for sitting in your home watching porno? And that's what Dallas and Dynasty and all these soaps are. They're porno. It's nothing but pornography. You're sitting there. Don't talk to us about Jimmy Swagger. What are you doing in your house with your television set? And I'm telling you, the day has come, and listen close, the day has come, the day has come that you cannot walk in the Spirit. You cannot be a man or woman of prayer. You cannot be a man or woman of holiness and righteousness and sit there anymore and watch that filth. You can't do it. God says no. God can't bless you. He won't do it. He, he, no, no clapping, no clapping. Listen, He's going, he going to take the anointing away from your household. Because even though God is screaming it lovingly in your ears, you say, no, I don't see it that way. And you walk in and you just open up the floodgates. That's the very eye of Satan. And that stuff just flows through your home. It's going to taint your children. It's going to ruin your family. It's going to ruin your marriage. Because it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Even the commercials are getting worse. Oh, boy. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here in just a minute. Revelation 6, 17, there's a question to ask. For the great day of his wrath has come, who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? Well, I'll tell you who's going to be able to stand. Those who are praying. Those who are walking in righteousness. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the, his presence of glory with exceeding great joy. I, I'm going to close in just a moment, but I, I can't close without saying something to you. And here's what God is, here, here's why he's saying come into the chamber. Here's why he's saying if you don't start praying, turn off your idols, get away from all that foolishness, and give me your heart, begin to pray. Folks, getting rid of your television set doesn't save anybody. What it does is remove the barrier and give you time to pray. If you don't use that time to pray, you're going to get bored and get mad at me. And, and I'll tell you what you do. You get rid of a 15-inch and go buy 21. All right, listen, before I close. Do you know that the Bible, the Bible said that Satan... I just read it. There's going to be a flood coming. And I... I, I was almost late uh, getting the car to come tonight. Gwen said, aren't you finished yet? And it, it was because God was saying something at the last moment. And here it is before I close. There's coming a time very soon when all of us are going to be swamped unexpectedly by a flood. It, it'll come to your life. You won't expect it. You'll be praying, seeking the Lord. You'll be rejoicing and basking in the light. And all of a sudden, there'll, there'll be a fear hit you. 
If you're just being swamped by the flood of the enemy, suddenly, unexpectedly, a sudden flood, suddenly you don't understand it, but there's a fear that's gripped you, a fear. It could be depression, the blues. Suddenly, you don't, you, didn't, you don't know where it came from. You can't think of anything you're worried about or anything that caused it. But suddenly, the enemy is upon you like a flood. There it is. You love the Lord. You're walking in His righteousness. You're walking by faith. And suddenly, you're, you're just flooded. You're flooded. Now, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit... It, it, it took Jesus in the wilderness, but he was tempted by the devil. If, if the devil can come right into the life of Jesus and tempt him, can you imagine what he's going to do to us? We're going to go through temptation. It's going to hit us. There are times when I've been, I've been so close to Jesus, and the very next day something will happen, the devil will provoke me somehow, and I'll lose my temper. I lose it. Then I go to my secret closet and say, oh God, how could that happen? How did... And I realized it didn't come from me. The enemy was provoking me. There was something there, yes, but God saw the victory. It was a flood. The flood's going to come. But folks, when that flood comes, don't panic. Don't panic. Run to the chamber. Run to the secret closet. Get a hold of God and say, Lord, that's not for me. That's from the flood. The devil's trying to swamp me. And I'm telling you, somebody's going to have it tomorrow. You're going to have it this week. Now, I want you to remember what I'm saying. In fact, I'm going to give you scripture to go to. And this is my last. Go to Psalm 142. When the flood comes, just go to Psalm 142 and throw it at the devil. And then we're going to close. Hallelujah. Didn't Jesus cast scriptures at the devil? Didn't he? Did the devil run? All right. We're, here's your stones. I mean, here, here's the Word of God. Psalm 142, only seven verses. Go to read them all. Just follow me. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I didn't pray silent. I cried out, man. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint. That means sorrows before Him. I showed before Him all my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed with me, that's the flood. Overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I have walked, I walked, have, thy, they, have they privily laid a snare for me? In other words, the devil's laid a trap for me. This is trying to get me discouraged and quit walking in his righteousness. I looked on my right hand, and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. So I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You will deal bountifully with me, Lord. You're going to answer prayer. Hallelujah. Now, the truth is, some of you are in that flood right now. You've been swamped. You don't even know what's happening. The devil just trying to do everything to discourage you, doing everything to try to get you to turn your back on him and to say that prayer doesn't work. It doesn't pay to walk so hard and strictly close to the Lord. But you know those are lies of Satan. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, tonight, send your Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord. The flood is coming. And you called us into the secret chamber. Come away and pray. God, you must have a praying people this last day. Who will go into their secret closet and lay before you and wait to hear your voice. Lord, we need guidance. We need to know which way to go. We don't know how to go out and come in. We don't know what to do in these last days. We're going to have to know your voice, Lord. We're going to have to hear you. We're going to have to be walking close to you, Lord. Because you want to speak. You want to give us clear, clear direction in these last days. Clear direction. Send your Holy Spirit, Father, the service tonight. Send the Holy Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right. Folks, would you look this way just one moment. I wish there was a way I could convey to you what I feel in my heart from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit calling us to prayer. In the last two weeks, I've had a burden for prayer, a burden of the Lord upon me. 
It's not enough to come Tuesday or Friday night just to prayer meeting. No, you've got to have that intimacy with Jesus. Folks, if you don't have, you're not going to make it. You're going to be carried away with the flood. You're going to be carried away. Some have already carried away. Do you, are you sitting here tonight having been carried away? You say, Brother Wilkson, I want the Lord to touch me. I want every backslider, everyone cold in heart, every one of you right now being flooded by the devil, just being flooded in your life. You want God to deliver you tonight. Step out of your seat and come and stand at the front. You gentlemen that are kneeling here, if, if you will just sit on your seat till later and then we will we'll be able to uh, have you intercede. We'll, we'll, we'll find a place. Up in the balcony, go right down to the middle stairs and come down either aisle. Right now, if the Holy Ghost is convicted, if He's speaking to your heart right now, He's saying, lay down your idols. Lay down your sins. Lay down your compromise. Get honest with me. Get honest with me. Up in the balcony, that's fine. There, there are numbers in that balcony moving. God bless you. We have the balcony almost full tonight. God bless you. Thank you. All right, having hated your sin, now let's call on his name. That's what he says. Call upon me in day of trouble, and I'll answer. Do you want to raise your hand? One hand, two hands? Whatever it takes. I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to repeat these words. Listen. These words won't save you, but if your heart's in it, he said, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Some of you don't know how to pray. Even the disciples had to ask Jesus to teach them to pray. I'm going to ask you to pray this sincerely, right out of your heart. If you'll pray it sincerely, the Holy Spirit will answer and touch you right now, and God will change it. Pray this with me. Jesus, I need a touch, and I need it tonight. I do hate my sins. I hate everything unlike you that has gripped my life and I lay it down, I confess it, I forsake it by faith. Come Lord Jesus, cleanse me with your precious blood. Forgive me. I believe you. I believe you answer my prayer and you're with me right now. Now Jesus, Put it in my heart to pray, to seek your face, to hear from you, to get to know your voice. I believe you'll speak to me, Jesus, if I'll just wait on you. Now just thank him in your own words. Thank him right now. Thank him, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, right now. I thank you and I praise you. Give you glory. Audience, will you stand? Everybody in the house stand, if you will, please. What are you singing? Huh? All right. Let's sing that. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That wait shall renew. tonight, right now, God wants you to have faith now, to release your faith. Say, Lord, I believe you. 
Uh, you know, some, it, it seems like it wouldn't work just come up here for a few moments. Yes, it does work because God is in this house. God is in this place. The Holy Spirit's here and He's touching you and He's healing you. I want, I want everyone here that's been living in sin. You have a habit. You have something that's been crushing you down. You want to be delivered. I want you to come through the crowd backstage. We're going to pray with you. All those that have been bound by sin, I want you to come right now. Make your way right out of the crowd. And over here, we don't need to know what it is. We're not going to announce it in public or anything else. It's between you and the Lord. I want you to come up the stage over this way because it's back here. Or you can go around the curtain. Right this way, please. Follow these that are coming up. Say, I want to be delivered tonight. I've got to be delivered. We need our personal counselors coming. Those who counseled this morning, I need you to come back and help us, please. Come this way. Right. Call upon your name and intercede, Lord. Turn us to prayer, Lord Jesus, that we become a praying people, a praying people, O Lord Jesus, that we would become a praying people, Lord Jesus. Let's just worship Him in His presence. Lord, we thank You for Your presence tonight. Lord, we thank You for Your presence tonight. Thank You for Your presence, Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to wait on You and pray and seek Your face. Teach us, O Lord. Glory to God. Manifest yourself in our midst. Manifest yourself. Hallelujah. Uh, I want us to sing again soon and very soon. We're going to see the King. Folks, I believe that. Soon, very, very soon, we're going to see the King. I want to be shut in with Him when it happens. I want to be shut in with Jesus. I want to be on my bones, my knee bones, calling on His name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many are ready to go? Are you ready to go? Hallelujah. How many have been resurrected from the dead? Raise your hand. <laughs> You've got all the wind and wave of false doctrine? Ah, now, resurrected from the dead. Let's sing. Soon and very soon we shall see. We're going to see the King. Sing it.